DuPont presents the Cavalcade of America. Certain of the letters received by DuPont, sponsors of the Cavalcade of America, have special qualities of interest which will appeal to other radio listeners. Such a letter as this one, received recently, and written by a member of that famous organization of actors, dramatists, and composers, the Lambs in New York City. I beg to thank you for the Cavalcade program. They are delighted. Last night's program brought tears to my eyes, happiness to my heart, and gratitude to you. I've spent my life in the dramatic profession, on the stage, in pictures, and in radio. I'm 70 years of age. Recently, my hearing has become impaired. But I can hear the radio, and I want to tell you how much I enjoy your program. Thank you again. Such a tribute repays every member of our cast for the efforts put into this entertainment. It is appreciated, too, by the DuPont Company, who sponsor these programs to spread wider knowledge of their service and their pledge. Better things for a better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra plays an overture based on some of the original themes used during the broadcasts of the Cavalcade of America, composed and arranged by our musical director, Harold Levy.
In the cavalcade of America, the instinct for self-preservation finds expression in the slogan, Safety First, or as poor Richard puts it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. In December 1733, Benjamin Franklin, creator of Poor Richard, published an article on fires and how to extinguish them. He deplored the fact that the city had no fire company. True, Philadelphia had then three hand-pumping engines placed about the city with nearly 300 leather buckets and a score of hooks for tearing down burning buildings. But there was no trained or organized group of men. The state of unpreparedness against fire continues until the year 1736, a street in Philadelphia. What's the matter? What are they ringing the church bells for? Well, I don't know. Perhaps it's... Fire, look. There's smoke down by the river. Oh, Lord, protect us. I wonder whose place it is. Here comes a boy on the run. I'll ask him. Hey, boy, boy. What? Where's the fire? Down in Bloodborough, I haven't gone down the street. The bucket's over it. Where's the bucket? I don't know. Nobody knows. Get buckets in or out of There must be some buckets near the market. I'll go there first. Get the hook, somebody. And pull down that house. Well, you can't do that. It hasn't caught yet. You've got to wait and see if it burns. You want to see the whole town burning? Get some hooks there. Where are the hooks? We've got more buckets. We can't keep water in the pump. Well, here's someone coming with buckets now. Yeah, Benjamin man. Franklin. Here, here. Here's some buckets I brought from the courthouse. Oh, thanks, Mr. Franklin. There's more there. Uh, here, you boys. Run back and get the rest. Yes. Now, all you men, uh, make one line from here to the river. Right, right, that's right. That's right. You women and boys, make another line. The men pass the buckets full of water to the pumping engine. Women pass the empties back to the river. Everything, sir. That's right. Hey, you men there. Tear down that next house. But, Mr. Franklin, it isn't burning yet. Well, if you don't tear it down, it'll catch fire any minute. And so will the whole city. Tear it down. On whose authority? In the interest of the city. Hey, here, boy. Get all your friends to form another line to the river. One more bucket brigade, and we'll give this fire a good fight. This narrow escape opened the eyes of the people to the danger of their unpreparedness. And when, soon afterwards, Franklin began to organize the Union Fire Company for mutual assistance in case of fire, scores of men were eager to join. But not satisfied with this precaution, Franklin took the next step and organized what is today the oldest fire insurance company in America. In April 1752, a group of distinguished and public-spirited citizens meet in the courthouse in Philadelphia to sign articles of association. Franklin is presiding. Governor Hamilton, yes. as representative of the proprietors of the province, your name should be first on this list. Very well, Mr. Franklin. If you'll put yours immediately under it. Gladly, sir. Uh, may I trouble you for the stand, Mr. Finch? We want no blot on our record. Here you are, Mr. Franklin. Oh, thank you. Uh, will you sign next? Certainly. Step up in turn, gentlemen. If the quill breaks, you will find a penknife in the drawer. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. The Philadelphia contribution ship for the insurance of houses from loss by fire. That's a pretty long title. Uh, we've already shortened it. Uh, we call it the hand in hand. The hand in hand? Uh, yes, from the emblem. Here is a drawing of it. Four hands clasped in Lady to London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Each yeah. hand seizes yeah. the next man's wrist. And that's the strongest grip possible. It's almost unbreakable. One of these emblems will be put in full view on every house we insure. And then in case of fire, everyone will know it's under our protection. How will that reduce losses? We'll employ watchmen and patrol. Oh, oh, yes. That'll discourage looting houses in the excitement of fire. And our volunteer firefighters will know we contribute to their company. Uh, Franklin, you have the most prudent head in the colony. Pray let me have one of these emblems for my house. We'll send you the first one. The hand-in-hand -hand emblem was cast in the same factory where, a few months later, they recast the Liberty Bell. Until 1783, the contribution ship was alone in its field. But in that year, a fire was carried from one house to another by means of a burning tree and several directors decided they would have to ask an extra premium for any house with a tree growing near it. Some other directors did not agree with this principle. It is discussed at a meeting of the directors. Oh, the whole thing... Gentlemen, it is perfectly evident that a tree close to a house is an added fire hazard. 
Therefore, we ought, in fairness, put an additional premium on all such policies. It's also perfectly evident, sir, that our streets are lined with fine shade trees. That many of our best houses stand in beautiful groves of trees. I see no reason why we should penalize properties that adorn our fair city. It is not a matter of penalty, but of risk. Let us put it to a vote. All in favor of a new policy. Aye. Aye. Contrary-minded? No. The majority stands with me in this business. Then, sir, some of us shall withdraw and make it our business to insure houses with trees around them. This minority formed the Mutual Assurance Company for the insurance of houses from lost by fire and adopted for their emblem a green tree. It is called the green tree to this day. For the next hundred years, very little progress was made in protecting property against loss from fire. Hydrants were placed along the street, and hand-pumping engines were used by the volunteers. But these volunteers were not the efficient firefighters that are found in many of our towns today. Here is an example of firefighting in 1852 in a small eastern city before the volunteers had become organized as they are now. Uh, where's your fire bucket? Oh, well, I'll get mine. It's in the hall where it belongs. You tell the volunteers where to go. Hurry. I will. Fire! There's a fire, mister. There, well, smoke's coming out. Go get your bucket. I don't live around here. Well, there's no use trying to use that barrel. Nobody could lift that full of water. I don't want anyone to well, lift it. Well, then put it down and come and help me with the bucket. Ah, uh, you go get your own bucket. I'll stay here with this barrel. I got a use for it. Oh, All right, boys. Out for right with the first engine here. Yeah, I guess nobody gets ahead of the high burning voice. Where's the water hydrant? Now scatter, boys. Look for the hydrant. Be quick about it. Here comes the French laddies with their linen hose. Hey, mister, have you seen the water hydrant around here? Can't see one. No more than you can. Well, don't sit there gaping. We gotta have water. Get off that barrel. Help us look for it. Can't. I got a bad leg. That's too bad. But there must be water somewhere around here. If we don't find it ahead of those French boys, they'll hook into one first. Hey, hey, come on, boys. Where they come <laughs> Hello, Hibernia, what's the matter? Afraid of a little fire? It won't burn you, boys. You're too green. <laughs> you take that back, friendship, as soon as we find the water. Why, where's your eyes? There's plenty of water right here. All right, laddies, bring the cart this way. Here's the hydrant. Where's the hydrant? I don't see them. All right, Jack. You can take that barrel off the hydrant now. All right, Joe. Friendship boys are all here. <laughs> Here's the hydrant, laddies. Hey, boys! Here's the hydrant. What? They hid it under the barrel. Stand back. Stand back, Hibernia. This is our water. We're putting out this fire. Oh, no. We got here first. We're putting the fire out. What with? With water from that hydrant. we got to hitch up to it first. We will. Come on, laddies. Play the ball. I don't have it. Play the ball. It's our fire. No use, lady. They won't stop now till one side wins. Then suddenly came one of those milestones that marked the progress of the onward march of the cavalcade of America. On New Year's Day in 1853, a crowd of people have gathered in front of the shops of John H. McGowan in Cincinnati, Ohio where for months they have been building the first practical steam fire engine for inventor Alexander B. Latter. Well, there she is, Mr. Latter, and she's a beauty. Yes, you've done a good job, McGowan. If it passes the test, we'll try it as soon as we get up more steam. Oh, Mama, let's get here. I can't see. All right. Would you mind letting my little boy through? He can't see over your head. Thank you. Here you are, Johnny. Come on. Thank you very much. Here we are, son. It's big, isn't it? And shiny. And that's Mr. Latter, the man who made it. I want to ask him about it. No, Johnny, come here. Are you Mr. Latter? Why, yes, son. Did you make that engine all by yourself? Well, not exactly. It took my friend McGowan here and his whole shop about nine months. All I really did was plan it. But how can it put out fires? Does it eat them? Oh, no, son, no. That firebox there is just to get up steam pressure. Then it pumps water of fire in a steady stream. Six streams, almost two inches thick. And water puts out fire, you know. Steam's up now, Mr. Letter. We're ready for the test. That's fine. Is Mr. Greenwood here yet? Right here, Letter. And I hope this brass monster of yours isn't just another hoax. I hope not, sir. There isn't much pressure in the city water pipes here, you know. All the better. 
We've marked off the street so you can see how far the engine will throw the water from the hose. I doubt if it throws all six of them very far at one time. It ought to throw them over 200 feet. If it does, I'll see that the city adopts your engine, even if we have to have a fire extillation to do it. <laughs> the hose is all connected, Mr. Leonard. Will you turn on the hydrant? I'll go down the street and check the distance. Will you turn on the water, Mr. Greenwood? Oh, no, that honor must be yours as the inventor. Thank you, sir. Everyone out of the way, right, please. Stand back there, Step to one side. Stand, stand by, men. All right. Better get two on each nozzle and brace yourself. <laughs> You're optimistic, right. Ladder. Well, so no. There we are. All right. Let her go. Why, why look at that? That's amazing. By George, Ladder, that's a sight. Congratulations. I, I can't see how far the stream well, carries. It's all of 200 feet. So Cincinnati had the first practical steam fire engine. And exactly three months later, also through the far-sighted civic efforts of Miles Greenwood, Cincinnati had the first department in America whose members were paid regular salaries. Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, moves on. American cities grew in size, but not in safety. Fire buckets were common equipment in public buildings and homes. Until, in 1905, a great invention based on chemistry brought safety a step nearer. It is evening, and the father comes home to his wife and children. Hello. Oh, Daddy. Hello, son. What have you got there, Dad? Ah, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, where's your mother? In the kitchen. Uh, hey, Mary, come here. I'm having supper, dear. Oh, just a moment. Come on out. Hey, Dad, what is it? It's a funny-looking thing. <laughs> sort of like a tank. Yeah. What is it you want, John? What? The baby's in the kitchen. I've got a kettle of deep fat on the stove. I don't like to leave it. Oh, look, I, I brought home a new piece of furniture. Furniture? That thing? What on earth is it? Something for the front hall. A copper tank in my front hall? Well, I should say not. <laughs> well, anywhere, just as long as it's handy. What for? Oh, come on back to the kitchen, John. I don't like to leave the baby. John, I smell smoke. Mom, Dad, oh, quick! The kitchen's on fire! I smell fat all over the floor! Oh, uh, Mary, Mary, come back here. You can't go through that fire. Oh, Stand back. John. This thing here. Stand back, I tell you. Oh, the baby's all right for a minute or two. When I turn this tank upside down. Now, uh, look out for the nozzle. Stand back, son. This will take care of the fire. Look. Look at it. It's putting out the fire. Now, wait a minute. It's going to be all right. Don't go in yet, Mary. All right, all right, all right. Now, there. Now you can go to her. Is she hurt? Oh, no. No, she's just frightened. Oh, there, there, darling. It's all right. Oh, the fire's going away. Hey, Dad, what is that thing you brought home? Son? That's a fire extinguisher. And by golly, it does. The first practical fire extinguisher was based on a simple chemical principle. When the cylinder was turned upside down, two chemicals mixed, generated pressure, and forced the liquid through a short hose. On contact with the fire, the liquid turned to gas that was heavier than air... And so the fire was smothered. Today, we take for granted the elaborate and complex organization of a modern city which makes equipment and coordination the first factors in safety. Let us trace a great New York City fire in the year 1936. During the evening, a fire starts in a warehouse on the riverfront. For a while, it burns unnoticed by anyone because at this hour, 12th Avenue is almost deserted. Then two men pass by. Say, Joe. Huh? I smell smoke. Well, what of it? Funnels of the ships around here are always smoking some. No, no, no. This, this smoke smells sort of bitter and sour-like. Hey, you notice it? Yeah. I never smelled smoke like this before. Say, I wonder if it... Well, well look. Huh? Where? Over at that warehouse. Ain't that smoke coming out over the tops of the window shutters? Why, looks like... Sure. And all along the whole side there. Say, the way it pushes out through those thin cracks. Looks there. like it was coming right to the wall. Up there near the roof. Yeah. 
Gee, it must be like a furnace somewhere's in there. We better give him the alarm quick. Yeah, there's a firebox over in the corner. I'll pull the box. You go look for a car. Right. The instant a firebox is pulled, the alarm goes directly to the telegraph bureau in Central Park. From that central point, the alarm is relayed simultaneously to all fire stations in Manhattan. Within two minutes after an alarm sounds anywhere in Manhattan, under any circumstance, at least one company will be at the scene of the fire. At this fire, the following units have responded to the first alarm. Two ladders, six pumpers, in this case one of them is a fireboat, one insurance patrol, one police car, two chiefs of battalion. All right. I'll take over, Captain. Okay, Chief. Looks like we'll have to fight it from the outside. You been inside yet? Yeah, got an axe on that door now. It's locked. Yeah, where's the watchman? None in sight. Well, we'll have a look in there. Peters. Right here, Chief. Give it a good blow near the lock. All right. That brings it. All right, come on. It blows. Yeah. Hey, there must be a lot of fire in there. Turn in the second alarm. Okay, Chief. Looks like it's taking all the floors on the riverside. Yeah. We'll have to fight it from the outside, all right. We open up much, much here. Be a trap. There's an oil tanker tied up to the dock back there. If she catches that. That's the word for the fireboat to get the tanker out in the stream. We'll never hold this with two alarms. Send in the third. Okay, Chief. For the second and third alarms, ten more engines, another fireboat, a rescue company with gas masks two trucks or hook and ladders, a water tower, a fuel wagon, and a battalion chief arrive on the scene. As it is night, a special call is sent for the searchlight. On the third alarm, calls are also sent to the local gas companies, officials of the fire department, the fire commissioner, and the department ambulance. In a few minutes, over 30 elements are converging on one place through heavy traffic. Meanwhile, on the fireboat... Make fast that oil tanker! Now, one of you men cut the horses that tired of the dock. Right, We've got to get her out in the river before she catches fire. Too oh, late, Captain. Those sparks are falling like rain on her deck structure. That's transfer streams on her. We've got to get her in the middle of the river in case she blows up. If she does, we'll go with her. That's the chance we got to take. Captain, and we have her on a tow line. All right. Move to the head. Lieutenant, the water won't help if that oil catches. Hour after hour, the firemen on water and shore struggle with no thought to safeguard life and property. What a contrast to Bud's fire in Philadelphia 200 years ago in 1736. Today, in towns and cities, through perfect preparation and coordination of men and material, combining almost lightning speed, the most modern instruments of science and engineering, with the intellect of men trained to act promptly on quick judgment, the lives and property are saved daily as a matter of routine. All honor to these fearless guardians of our safety, brave riders in the cavalcade of America. This evening's program, pay tribute to those whose job is to uphold the rule of safety first. But they can't do that work alone. You and I must do our part to safety first more than just a slogan. A large number of products are available to help everyone to do things the safe way, and many of them have been contributed by chemistry. On the stage of this theater from which we broadcast, there is a good reminder of how chemistry aids safety first. Stage scenery is treated with a chemical to make it fire resistant. An important development of DuPont Laboratories is a fire resistant motion picture screen made of a coated textile for which DuPont's trademark is Fabricoid. This same safety principle, chemical treatment to defeat flames, has recently been made available for homes. Mattresses have frequently been the starting point of fires, but DuPont chemical products are now used by manufacturers to make mattresses fire resistant. This chemical treatment likewise repels vermin, thus safeguarding health. 
It is also a comfort to know that when you visit a doctor's office or hospital, to have an X-ray picture made, that safety X-ray film is now used exclusively for such work. DuPont chemists pioneered in the making of this fire-resistant product. But there are other things besides fire to think of in connection with safety. For example, the skidding rug is a dangerous menace in every home. If you ever see anyone slide on a rug and crash on the floor, don't laugh. A good many legs, hips, and arms are broken that way, and you might be the next to make a pancake landing. DuPont chemists have minimized that hazard by developing a cushion underlay sold for the trademark Rug Anchor. This product, when placed under a rug, tends to anchor the rug to the floor, thus preventing the danger of skids or slips. Rug anchor also lengthens the life of the rug because of its cushioning effect. If you would like to have a sample of rug anchor so you can test its non-slip properties for yourself, just write to DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. We'll be glad to send you free a piece five inches square, large enough to put under a base or some other object about the house to prevent skidding. Merely write to DuPont, D-U-P-O-N-T, Wilmington, Delaware, and ask for your free sample of DuPont's non-skid underlay rug anchor. All the Safety First products that I have mentioned show how DuPont chemists make good their pledge. Better things for better living through chemistry. many communities, daylight saving goes into effect next Sunday morning. So self-reliance, the story of courageous American women, will be heard next week at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, when DuPont again presents the Cavalcade of America. This is the Cumbia Broadcasting System. W.A.B.C. New York.